Hello, welcome back to Let the Stone Speak. I'm Brent Noctical, the host of the program. We've got a really important program for you today. I'm not in the office, I'm actually in the Negev. Here I'm standing on what looks to be a Davidic period structure, some type of outpost or garrison. There's a few of these that are dotted along the Negev and then also down into the Arava Valley. We talked with uh, Dr. Tali Erickson Guinea. Uh, she works for the Israel Antiquities Authority and just in the past couple of weeks she's been discussing these 10th century BCE structures along here uh, in the Arava Valley dating to King David's time. So we've got an interview coming up with her at, the, at, one, of these, at one of these locations in Hatseva, about an hour's drive further south from here. This is a very important program. No one's really been talking about these and so this is cutting edge archaeology from here in Israel for you. Please, if you like these videos, subscribe to our channel. We'd we'll love to keep on producing this type of content for you. But even if you don't do that, definitely listen to today's episode of Let the Stone Speak. So thanks very much for having us down here in uh, Hatseva. This is, we, we took about three hours to get here this, this morning, um, but we're so grateful that you spared some time to come down and show us this amazing site that we hadn't been to yet. Mm -hmm. The reason we're doing this is because just a week and a half ago, I, I listened to you give a, a really quite dramatic uh, presentation for the Israel Antiquities Authority on Zoom regarding this frontier between Judah or the United Monarchy uh, in Israel and Edom, mm -hmm. which is kind of where we're located right now, although maybe perhaps a little bit further to the south. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could discuss with us a little bit of your history in this area and then where we're situated. Well, I've been, um, I worked in the Antiquities Authority here in Israel uh, for over 30 years, and I've been acquainted with this site since there were really large scale excavations by Rudolf Kohn, the late Rudolf Kohn and Yigal Israel one of my mentors and one of my bosses in the Antiquities Authority and a good friend of mine. And um, so I was already coming down here as early as 1993, 1994. Uh, the excavations were still continuing until at least 1995. And over the years after that, uh, the organization that's, in, that's taken over this uh, site, the Blossoming Rose Organization, um, had asked us to do some small-scale excavations with their volunteers, uh, also some uh, conservation work. And so I'd been working off and on with them, mainly in the Roman period remains here. Mm -hmm. uh, but back in 2013, I was asked to excavate right close to here, right close to where we're sitting. And uh, I excavated uh, one of the, what I would say would be the earliest stratum that's been discovered here at the site. And as far as geography goes, you know, where are we uh, in terms of Israel's geography, the, the mm -hmm. neighboring the neighboring peoples? Well, we're obviously we're in the, the Rift Valley, mm -hmm. uh, south of the Dead Sea. Uh, if you look across here, you can see the Edomite Highlands. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not that far, probably almost opposite of ancient Bozra, okay. uh, Bucera in, uh, in southern Jordan today. Um, and so we're very much, uh, very, very close to the Edomite frontier. Uh, 3,000 years ago at this point. Uh, we're also on a main artery, a main road that's running from here more towards the southeast uh, towards the mining district of Feinan. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be in the Hebrew scriptures, that would be Punun that okay. we see on the Exodus uh, route. And um, so this was a very, very important route uh, between Egypt, ancient Egypt, and the this copper mining district of Punun, uh, Feinan. Uh, we know that there were, we, we've discovered remains along this, this road from as early as the early Bronze Age period. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the Iron Age period, this site becomes a very important junction. And we're actually at a junction today. You can probably hear in the background, you can hear the trucks on, the, on Highway 90. So you had roads that were going north and south in this area, but also mainly from uh, northeast, northwest to southeast. Uh, towards Edom and towards mainly towards the uh, the mining district of Fainan. So, what I want to zoom into right now is this period um, relating to three thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, this concerns this wall that's uh, this yeah. nice nice size wall <laughs> that I'm actually quite surprised by the amazing preservation <laughs> it of it. Yeah. Um, going back uh, 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the way here, we started in Jerusalem. If we go back 3,000 years, 
capital of David, capital of the United Monarchy. Mm -hmm. You know, I went through Bet Shemesh, arguments, that that's a 10th century site yeah. even. Then we went past uh, Kibbutz Kayafa, mm -hmm. 10th century site. We went past Kibbutz Arai before we turned on the, mm -hmm. the six. And then we drove. Mm -hmm. We drove for an hour and a half. And now we're all the way down here and we're still talking about a 10th century yeah. site, almost all the way down mm -hmm. to a lot. So there's probably some debate over this structure that's behind us. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about what we know, what is generally agreed upon, what is this structure behind us, what's its shape, and then you can talk perhaps about the sequence that would mm -hmm. ar help us arrive at a date for it. Well, this particular structure was discovered uh, very late in the excavations of Rudolf Kohn and Yigal Yisrael. Uh, Yigal had an idea and he came back in the early 2000s to continue to work here, to work around until he understood more precisely what, what this, this structure was, uh, what an early date was. In the meantime, they also had uh, radiocarbon dates uh, from inside the structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had a pretty good handle uh, on the structure as being somewhere between the, somewhere earlier than the 9th century, 9th and 8th century uh, fortress that you have here that was right. kind of sitting a little bit inside of it. Mm -hmm. And um, this, this particular tower, which I consider is kind of a tower, mm -hmm. Uh, Rudolph had thought of it as kind of a four, kind of a four-room house in a way. Uh, they have, there's something like it in the Negev Highlands. The difference being that these have these kind of towers seem to be one or two stories high. Uh, they're quite high. They have a, quite a high platform around them, and um, they seem to have no entrance to them. They have to be accessed from above, probably through rope ropes or rope. Uh, ladders or something of that sort to get in and out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, quite an unusual kind of uh, architecture in a way. But the, what's interesting, and I learned this of course from Yigal, who was the first to introduce me to it, we have others like them uh, going to the north along the Dead Sea coast and also uh, towards the Rod, for so, example. So this was um, the most dramatic part for me <laughs> of, yeah. your, of, your, um, of your presentation, just because we're trying, to, we're trying to get our heads into the 10th century as much as possible mm -hmm. to find every bit of evidence that we can for not just structures, but also industry. You talked about the copper industry that would have yeah. traveled through here as well. Mm -hmm. And then I saw your presentation and I see dotted along the, the uh, eastern side of yeah, what we yeah. call Israel. Yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> that one right there. Right there right. And we're, we're here almost to the, on the bottom there. Yeah, there's of more that. of them. Yeah. And there's more of them all the yeah, way along. So down. if we're going to, if mm -hmm. you're saying that this one is, is conclusively dated to the 10th century, mm -hmm. um, how many of these others um, are, are they similar design to this? Yes, and they are. are, are, yeah. are that, do we have dating for them? Well, the problem being that the, the two that were excavated by Aroni back way back in the 50s were not published, mm -hmm. and little is known about them. We know a little bit about one that's right on the Dead Sea coast called Gozal. Uh, in that particular site, there was actually some very early pottery from Arabia, from Northern Arabia, called that we like to call today Koraya ware. They used to call it Midianite ware, published by Ben Rothenberg and uh, in glass. Uh, this is the kind of pottery that we find in the foundations of this kind of tower. So it predates and, the tower, um, this earlier Yeah, it pottery. should predate or or at least have been around, it, at least in a residual way, around okay. yeah, the end of the, uh, uh, of the 11th century and maybe a little bit later. Um, there's some different ideas about how, how much later it extends, how, or when the cutoff date is. There's a mm -hmm. little bit of controversy about that. But they ha we have it here, we have it at this site, we have it at Gozal that Ar Aroni had excavated. It was also discovered in Tel Khalifa, uh, which in another tower of this type, which mm -hmm. was discovered uh, and excavated by Nelson Gluck, Gluck back in the day. They also have later kind of Edomite painted pottery. There was a little bit of uh, uh, discussion about understanding what was, what was Midianite ware, right. or we call it Karaya ware, but it was definitely there. And they have them all three of these sites. Another site close by here that was excavated, Mitzad Mazal, which is right on the southern, right below the southern uh, part of the Dead Sea. Um, there's obviously Iron Age, but not very much known about it. Like, again, it hadn't been published. Uh, there I haven't heard of any core I wear. Uh, but other types of buildings like this we know are dotting uh, the way going north, also going towards Arad. 
Um, these have not been published. I mean, they haven't been excavated and they haven't been published. But, so but, very little is known about them. But we can. But this one's been excavated and uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah. and hopefully, fully published soon. Yeah. Um, and you know, if we go back three thousand years, we're going back to around a thousand BC. This is the time period. If we're going to match it with the biblical text, this is the mm -hmm. time period of King David. Um, and I suppose this is why it's well, Solomon to Solomon, David and Solomon. Solomon sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the Bible also talks about. Um, that they did come down this far into mm -hmm. Edomite territory, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, well, we, we know that there was a lot of interaction between Edom, first of all, under the time of King Saul. There was already wars going on between Edom and Saul, uh, among other peoples. He was at war with most right. of the neighbors. And uh, under David, there seems to have been a much, much more massive presence uh, under the United Monarchy, and this seems to have continued... Uh, right through the 10th century, probably as late as uh, Rehoboam or Rehavam, we say in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, it's assumed, by the way, that most of these went out of use around the time of the Shishak invasion, which right. would be around plus minus 925 BC. That seems to be the situation we have in the Negev Highlands, and that's why I included it. I want to make mention the fact that uh, this is currently being investigated and published by uh, Dr. Doron Benami from mm -hmm. the Israel Antiquities Authority. He has been working here and he can, wants to continue working uh, in the site um, and he's going to be bringing some more new material. So we'll see what comes out of that. Uh, what I'm telling you about is the material that's already known that right. we know from the earlier excavations that Yigal, uh, first Yigal did and also from the time of Rudolph. I just want to read, just want to read, this is actually from your uh, presentation, so okay. this might be very familiar for you. This is Second Samuel 18, 8, mm -hmm. sorry, verse 13 at 14, it says this, And David got him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men, and he put garrisons in Edom. Mm -hmm. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons, so it confirms mm -hmm. doubly what he did. Uh, and all they of Edom became David's servants. And mm -hmm. then it's, it's mentioned again uh, by the chronicler as well mm -hmm. uh, later on. So this is something that the Bible draws attention to twice, yeah. that David was going to put down here, and it wouldn't be settlement, you know, David, mm -hmm. Israel, they're, they're Dan they're to garrisons, Beersheba, yeah. but they're garrisons, they're mm -hmm. outposts. Do you see one of these as that type of thing, or do you, do you find others, <laughs> other garrisons? As well, outpost is a good way to put it because these seem to be almost like little islands, mm -hmm. like little tower islands right. that they're inaccessible uh, from the outside. You have to have special means to get in and out of them. And uh, that's kind of unusual. So it, obviously there, there, there doesn't seem to be much of a settlement around here. It's true that we have an earlier, um, some kind of industrial operation going on here that's not fortified. It continues to be used or it's renewed at the time that the tower is being used. So there's something going on next to it in the immediate vicinity, but I wouldn't really call it any kind of village or uh, we're not really sure. We, we don't, it's it, actually, it's buried under everything. So we don't know the exact extent of it. Uh, I haven't heard that they've ever found anything like that in, in any of the other sites. The, the closest we come to it, maybe Tel Khalifa, mm -hmm. where we have the next phase, we have, of course, the, uh, the fort, the smaller fortress and a larger fortress. Right. Here we have something the same. If we could just, so people know where Tel Khalifa is, because this is a mm -hmm, separate yeah. story in itself. I mean, this this is a place that was excavated uh, back in the 30s, if my memory is, yes, is correct, right, all the way right. down on the shore of the Red Sea, just mm -hmm. mo close to modern day. Well, it's between Eilat and Aqaba, is mm -hmm. it? Like it's, kind of it's, I was there a few years ago. It's very, very close to the, the fence between Israel and Jordan like maybe 50 meters away. Right. I don't know if even 100 meters away. It's really right close to the fence. It's in very bad condition, at least at the time I was there, and they've done a lot of development near it. They've, the Jordanians have preserved, have left it there, right. but there's a lot of major development nearby. Uh, but I can say that uh, what, what uh, Nelson Glick had excavated has been difficult to understand. For sure. Mainly the tower. Right. And so there's one of these yeah, there. Yeah, there's a tower like that. It was not understood at the time. What's nice about we, what we have here at Hatseva is we have very, very firm stratigraphy because here you can see very well that the uh, one of the, the piers of the gatehouse of the uh, ninth century fortress right. is sitting on top of the corner of it. It cancels the use of, of this. It cancels the use of it. 
And so the stratigraphy is very, very tight here. You can see we have an earlier uh, level below us, next to us and below us. Uh, then we have the tower, and then we have the fortress which is built above so it. So you got this sandwich. Sandwich, which... a sandwich, yes. Now we don't have the situation at Tel Khalifa. There, everything was kind of built around. So you have the tower, then you have, it's kind of sitting in the courtyard of mm -hmm. the later uh, fortress, and then the larger fortress is, is encircling the, the, the smaller fortress. So uh, that was not understood. Here we actually understand. We know we can see what the sequence is. Even if we didn't have the dating, we would know what the sequence right. is. And then tell Khalifa, if I could just mention the, the Bible, biblical text again, Second Chronicles 8, verse 17, it says mm -hmm. this, Then went Solomon to Izzi and Geber and to Eilat at the seaside in the land of Edom. Mm -hmm. And so this... Where is Izzy and Geber? has been a, a big discussion mm, yeah. over the years. I guess general consensus is that it probably should be somewhere where Tel Khalifa is. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that you have a similar, what you well, believe, time, what you believe. Yeah, uh, we seem to, if, if, if what we're seeing here, it seems that we have the same type of tower in Khalifa as we do in this area around the Dead Sea. And, um, and it seems to be connected with the copper. There's mm -hmm. also a connection with that. Uh, I can tell you that um, that one of the things that we have in the the uh, area around Aqaba a lot is a type of uh, mineral which is a kind of mica, mm -hmm. a gold mica, uh, called biotite or biotite, and that actually shows up in a lot of pottery uh, from that area that's produced in that area also in later periods. A few years ago, I was lucky enough to see um, an, in the storerooms of the Israel Antiquities Authority a uh, negabyte, what we call a handmade negabyte um, pot uh, that had been restored. That was from Yodvata, from the uh, 10th century or 11th century uh, fortress of Yodvata. That's been published recently by uh, Zev Meschel, Professor Zev Meschel and Lily Zinger of Vitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was looking at it, I was astounded. For one thing, we could see in the, you can see in that pot, uh, slag inclusions, which shows that it was being produced in some site that had slag production. It was some kind of copper production with slag, uh, and, but it also had biotite. And to my mind, it probably was produced in Aqaba mm -hmm. and at that site. Again, that, the, that was found in a, um, in a structure that's dated to the second half of the 11th century. Uh, here we have also negabyte pottery, also with slag inclusions from the late, very late 11th century. But this is probably being produced in Fainan. Mm -hmm. It does not have the biotite. Neither does the type of handmade pottery we have in Timna. But here we do have a pot that has that that evidently is coming from from uh, from uh, Tel Khalifa. So mm -hmm. there's connections here. We see conne very definite parallels of architecture and finds. Um, this handmade ware that has the the uh, by, that has the slag inclusions, mm -hmm. including what I discovered here for myself, and what was discovered inside the tower. And so here. that that those the the negabyte ware that you talk about that has the slag copper slag inclusions mm -hmm. in it, this is a this only exists during a certain period, right? It's like a diagnostic uh, well, element, is it? It seems to be diagnostic. We still don't know enough about it because um, the handmade period, uh, handmade pottery continues into the next period, mm -hmm. into the iron 2B period, but nobody's checked to see if it still has the slag in it. Mm -hmm. We know that from this time period, quite a lot of it, and I can say probably almost everything that I found here had that. And we can assume that it was produced in Fainan. And we can assume it was produced in around the 10th century or earlier. We, Fainan, of course, uh, what was excavated by Tom Levy and Iris Ben Yosef in, in Fainan, uh, it shows that they have also the same time period from the later part of the 11th century until the early 9th century basically covering all the 10th century, which would be what we the have same here time. With, so the, yeah, with yeah. the same. So the same time, I mean, we just talked to Erez Ben Yosef a couple of weeks ago, interviewed mm -hmm. him, really fascinating. If people it haven't is, yeah. heard it. He's doing astounding work, really. Yeah, and, yeah. and so we're dealing with something mm -hmm. here that's from the same period of that's maximum mm -hmm. output that he, he was talking mm -hmm. about there, which is the same period of maximum output mm -hmm. as Fainan, which is on the road from yeah. here. This is a crossroad for that. I want to talk about uh, we'll just leave these 10th century forts sure, for a yeah. second uh, and talk about another excavation that you've done, which mm. also brought, surprisingly, uh, another 10th century um, period uh, fortification mm -hmm. uh, a little bit further from here. Perhaps you could talk about that. Uh, that was in the Negev Highlands in a site called Har Ildad. So how far from us is that? Well, it would be, uh, it's on the area, 
north of Mitzpe Ramon, north of the Ramon Crater. So to get there, it would be it would be a good two and a half hour drive from here okay. to get there. There's no direct route to get there from here. And I, w- I should add, you've you've lived here for yeah, I've a lived long time. I lived in the Negev. I lived in Moshav Kadesh Barnea, right on the western border. Uh, since around 1985. So, so if anyone's <laughs> going to know this area and have trekked around this area, you, s- you throw out all these terms like we're all familiar with them, <laughs> this distance from this distance, but yeah. mm-hmm. this is your home. You've, you've, yeah, you've pretty much. I mean, I, um, and I was in charge as a uh, antiquities inspector, um, sub-districts uh, inspector for many years on mm-hmm. most of this area. Okay. All the Negev highlands and also parts of the Arva. So I've excavated near the Dead Sea, down here, down closer towards Eilat, Yod Vata, Timna, all the Negev highlands, <laughs> you name it. I have a lot of excavations. Uh, and Which and allows you to know the material of a wide area and can do some yeah. type of a survey kind of de- and understanding. Not, and not from one period. I work on, I, I like to tell people, um, I think sometimes in academia, they, they, there's, a, there's kind of a tendency to look their nose down, uh, people working in the Antiquities Authority, but the truth is that the, we have wonderful, not t- speaking about myself, we have wonderful um, excavators, mm-hmm. and we excavate all the time. We excavate right. all year round, we excavate different time periods. It gives you a very wide view of things. It gives you, uh, obviously, you can't become uh, an expert on everything. Right. However, I think that uh, we, we really have a great opportunities, and I feel like I've had over 30 years, I've had wonderful opportunities. And, and I think I would have been missing out if I'd been an academic working in only one time period. So I've been working in periods like the Early Bronze Age and the Intermediate Bronze mm-hmm. Age, this time period, uh, and later, up right up until the 20th century. Right. I even published things about that. And um, I think it bothers academics to some extent, and I, and I get that feedback a little bit every so often. But that's our job. I mean, we, this is this is our work, and this is what we do. And you learn. Well, from it. I think uh, I mean you, we were just talking before the interview about how some of the very early archaeologists coming through here. It turns out that a lot of their work was very good. Yeah. A lot of their work was. It turns out to be correct even mm-hmm. decades after, and they had a very broad understanding exactly, through different yeah, periods yeah. as well. It's something that's probably mm-hmm. we're, we're quite lacking. Back to this now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Har Eldad. Yeah. So Har Eldad is a site. It's out. Har means mountain, but it's not actually on a mountain. It's actually on quite a low hill next to Highway 40. Uh, you can just drive right off the road up to it. It's a uh, small kind of a squarish looking uh, fortress. Mm-hmm. We would call it fortress uh, with casement rooms. It was excavated by Rudolf Cohen uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Fortunately for us, he did not excavate the courtyard. He had excavated the rooms around there, around the casement rooms on the perimeter. Um, we came back with school children. We were working with school children. I was a bit horrified at the idea because I'm, I think that some things like this are just, they're so special <laughs> and uh, they need to be preserved. You have to be very careful. So our idea, and this is what we've done in Timna as well, is to try to work in the same areas that have already been excavated. Right not to open up new things. And so we were working in the, the, the casement rooms. Uh, however, afterwards, after a few sessions like this, when we finished the project, I was given workers and I, I was able to actually use the workers one day to work inside the courtyard. And I saw pottery uh, that really was kind of amazing. Some of it looked like it could have come from the Edomite Highlands and also a lot of neck bite wear again. So I got in touch with Professor uh, Eris uh, Ben Yosef, and he and his student, Willie uh, Onerchik, uh, were very kind, had brought some students down. Other members of the Israel Antiquities Authority showed up, Sargon Orr, Chaim Mamalia, who was my co-director, and uh, several other people, Vladik Lifshev, Emil uh, Alajem. And we worked one day, and Willie had brought his children, his two mm-hmm. sons, and uh, his son, his younger son, who was in one corner of this courtyard, uh, says to me, Tali, there's a grape seed here. And I was astounded because we'd been working on the other side of the courtyard and sifting and we hadn't found a single thing. <laughs> this little boy was looking and they have good eyes, I know that. And they looked down and he saw the grape seed. He brought his father and his brother came rushing over, got down on their hands and knees and started really going through everything. They eventually found over 40 grape seeds. Wow. And we, at the same time, we also found uh, while we were looking for the grape seeds, we suddenly saw the bottom of a, of a vessel, which Willie very carefully uncovered. It was a complete crater. It's a Philistine type crater from that was produced sometime somewhere in the southern Shvela mm-hmm. area. 
uh, Sarganor, who was with us, had just been excavating in Kirbet Rai, and he said, oh, we found exactly that crater like two weeks ago. <laughs> and ours was actually more intact. We ours Yours had was. the hands, all of it was there. What was amazing was that there was also grape seeds inside the crater. So the crater had very obviously been full, probably of wine or something, and it had, had, had rolled along the floor. And the seeds had spilled out part, but part of them were still inside the crater. This is something that had never been discovered before. In any, and I think Rudolf excavated uh, a couple dozen of these fortresses, and nobody had ever seen anything like right. this. And it was just amazing. Um, Professor Ben Yosef was very kind uh, to provide funding for radiocarbon dates. It turns out that the dates for the seeds we had were from the mid 10th century BC and even earlier, from right. the late 11th century. Um, and also, uh, Willie did a photography um, analysis which confirmed what we could see pretty much visually was that the, the material was from the southern Shvela. It's a tradition, kind of an Aegean tradition uh, of a crater, a wine crater, uh, that was found also in Rai and later it keep, continued to be found in Tel Safi in the 9th century, that kind of thing. So this is, I mean, you've got a vessel, it's full of 40 grape seeds, you do carbon <laughs> dating on them, but dates back to give or take around yeah. 3,000 mm -hmm. uh, 3, years ago, 1,000 yeah. BC, mm -hmm. around King David's time as well. And mm -hmm. here we are in kind of this buffer zone between yeah. the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, mm -hmm. well, Judah and Edom. Yeah. Yeah. Or again, what the, what the biblical well, the, text Well, in this say. time period, it would have been the United Monarchy, United Monarchy, but it would have been the territory of Judah. Right. So, yeah. And so mm -hmm. you, you went to this site. Did you anticipate the 10th century date already um, or, yeah? Well, I should say that um, from everything I know, there there really hasn't been any real controversy around the date of those fortresses okay. in the Negev Islands. Uh, nobody had really had, d some have tried to maybe make some of the material a little bit earlier, but generally there's a consensus across the board that these were from the 10th century. There's a consensus that they were probably all abandoned around 925 uh, BC, okay. the time of the Shishak invasion, mm -hmm. Egyptian invasion. Uh, but uh, beyond that, the, there, there was there was a more of a problem of the function of the of the right. sites and their identity. Um, there had been ideas had been put forward. First of all, but been a Rottenberg that these were settlements that they weren't actually fortresses or right. uh, that they were. And he even said, well, they could have been the Malachites. The Malachites settled down. Uh, Yisrael Finkelstein took this kind of ran with this idea, uh, looking to the possibility that these were some kind of settlement sites at the courtyards, like where right. we were excavating, where we found the wine crater. Uh, from <laughs> Philistia uh, were some kind of um, corrals mm -hmm. for sheep and goats or okay. something with some kind of agricultural use. Um, I think to a great extent uh, more recent research and also what we've done is kind of put to rest that these were actually fortresses mm -hmm. or forts. Th their position very deliberately along roads, um, a line facing the Ramon Crater. Like facing the east, just on yeah. the ridge, and facing also down. Yeah, well, they're not right on the ridge. They're not exactly on the ridge, mm -hmm. a little bit further back. Right. They're hold back. Uh, they have, uh, usually have cisterns, open cisterns next to them. We have quite a lot. We, Not all of them have been discovered, by the way. I mean, right. we have, we've had surveys. There's a whole how many, lot How many do you think of these fortress type things in this buffer zone? Um, exists uh, from, well, from the Iron 2A? They, we know of at least 60 and there's actually more than that because I've been in places that we know out in, in uh, areas that the IDF uses for mm -hmm. firing ranges and there's more. There's so more why, why in the world do we not hear more about these? Well, I don't. I haven't. I heard your, your I presentation. I think part of it, first of all, Rudolf, uh, he published this on the basis of the research he did in his PhD thesis uh, from the years before. And he published this in the early 2000s, okay. but in Hebrew. Okay. So the one book we have with the maps and everything is all in Hebrew. So I think that's a big part of it. Okay. I think that if, now he did publish something about it, for example, mm -hmm. I think in um, probably bi Biblical Archaeological Archaeology uh, Review, or maybe bi or BA Biblical Archaeology. Yeah. He, he did publish some things, you know, right. but just like lone uh, articles and they kind of got left behind. Right. People didn't really pay attention. In the meantime, the emphasis had been trying to prove that these were settlements and that right. they were agricultural use. And um, and so that, I think they just kind of, in Hebrew you say they fell between the chairs. They, right. they didn't, they, they, just, they just kind of got lost out of sight. I think if people have been talking about them as fortresses in the first place, as, as Rudolph did, right. and other people, Rudolph was not the only one, Aroni has also said that, 
uh, that they would have gotten more attention. But that just got kind of pushed aside because of all the... the so why, why is that? Well, I mean, you're an archaeologist, but you've obviously got theories about things <laughs> as well outside of just the strict, <laughs> you know, excavation of the ground. I mean, we read through a couple of uh, passages of the, of the Bible, which talks about, you know, David doing something in this area, mm -hmm. garrisons, outposts, something in this area between yeah. Edom or in Edom. Mm -hmm. And then you have 50 or 60 plus these other Over 60. ones like yeah. this in this well, whole area. These are area. even more. These even go beyond what the 60 that I mentioned of the negative highlights. Right. This is a whole nother thing. And so this is like a home. whole world of, of yeah. fortresses. Or, well, I'm or, hoping that now Doron Benavi is starting to work on this, uh, this site, and I'm hoping that the, this generation, like the coming generation, will start looking into it and start doing research on it. There's, mm -hmm. there's what to excavate. There's, they're, they're out there. They can be excavated. They can be discovered. Um, I think it's good to keep in mind what Egal, I mean, it talks. I mean, it's not just digging one thing. This one was quite clear, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the others as well, you have to take these things uh, as an assemblage. When right. you're working in archaeology, as you probably know, you well know, uh, I work with pottery most of the time. Pottery, we look at assemblage, and we don't look at the assemblage. We don't cut it up. We don't. We don't. We look at it. We say, "What else is coming with it?" It's not just the pottery shirts. What about the lamps? What about the coins? What about the, right. the context it's in? This is an assemblage. So this is part of an assemblage of other things, just like the assemblage that Rudolph had paid attention to in the Hennepin Highlands. So that's an assemblage. This is an assemblage. And I think they need to be studied that way and not as something just it's a, one by one. It's, it's not a know. unique feature, it's a pattern yeah. of, of, exactly. yeah. of, of, of fortifications. Mm -hmm. um, you did mention one, I think, thing that stood out, stood out to both Chris and I in your, in your message. And, and it, it talked about, you talked about how you've got the IDF, a lot of them train up in the Negev mm -hmm. Highlands area. Yeah. And then I don't know if they know <laughs> what they're training around they don't they <clears throat> these are really smart young people okay but their knowledge of history and geography is very very poor i mm -hmm. would say uh usually the more those that come from more religious backgrounds usually have a better idea i'll say where is edom and right. most people will point in the opposite direction <laughs> no <laughs> it's that way uh, but I do find those that do have some idea they know I'll say who is Edom you know where did the name come from uh, so I end up telling them giving them kind of a lesson but one of the things I want that I talk about and I it's very important for me and I know for also our education department we've been talking about trying to get that not just through Tali but also right. through other researchers is, is that they can connect to their surroundings where they're doing the, the officers training is exactly in an area that has a huge assemblage of these this time period cisterns open cisterns and these fortifications and not just fortresses also towers small right. towers uh, in the past I've come along and found them used for training that they had targets in them and I've had to tell them so we have to train them so you know, what did you tell them well I told them this is an ancient site uh, what by the way about uh, four or five years ago we discovered a small fortress that also Rudolph had excavated Again, they were using it, they'd moved the stones around, and they didn't do a lot of damage, but they, but we brought them and started making it as part of their training course to come and actually work in the site, to clean the site up, put the stones back, and not to use it anymore for target practice, or, right. you know, or at least if they're in it, not to touch anything. Right. So, but, but when you tell them, okay, for them, okay, it's an antiquity, but what antiquity? Uh, they know that in that area, there's the incense road, the Nabataeans. Mm -hmm. They know a little bit about that, they've been told. But most of the people that are training them, most of their educator, they have ed educational um, um, guides, I guess you could say, with the, uh, with the IDF. They don't even know. They right. don't know that you're sitting inside a frontier, that this was a frontier with, with fortresses and towers. And there were actually Israelite soldiers <laughs> that were there, and they were manning those places uh, at least for several decades, mm -hmm. over 3,000 years ago. And when you tell them, they're very excited. Oh, I'm they sure. Don't, yeah, I mean, they. I say, you're on the front. You're, you're here, right here in Hebrew, you say, Chazit. This is the front. This is the frontier. You're facing the enemy. There's a reason that, that they're so concentrated along this line, along the roads. Uh, and you explain these things to them. It, it gives, all of a sudden, they, the context, they start to look at the landscape differently. Mm -hmm. They start to look at the roads, the wadis. The, they see everything in a different light. But that's important for, for, I think it's important for, for them, for their training as well. Uh, because, uh, and what we know, especially from, <coughs> um, from Wingate, Lord Wingate, 
who would go back to the Hebrew Bible. He would be studying. He's up in, you know, the Galilee, the Jezreel mm -hmm. Valley. He's reading about Gideon. He was using the Bible for his uh, actually training what became the IDF. They, he, the people he worked with originally really didn't know what they were doing as far as uh, defensively, and he had to train them. And he used the Hebrew Bible, and he actually taught from it. And I think there's something to that, because the landscape is the same landscape. Right. And the, the problems can be the same problems. And I explained to them, too, there will be a day that there won't be any satellites. There will be a day that you won't have GPS. There will be a day when there's no cell phone. And you will have to fight, and you will have to know. You'll have to know the landscape. This is the same landscape that people were dealing with, our people were dealing with over 3,000 years ago. So I th for me, it's very exciting, and I think they get excited, too. When well, they I it. think they would. I think it's to connect them back to their own history. They're totally oblivious history. to it, and actually, unfortunately, <laughs> most archaeologists are, too. <laughs> well, that's why we wanted to come well, and talk you. to you about this. I appreciate about, giving the this. chance to talk about it, yeah. Well, thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much to Dr. Tali erickson Guinea of the Israel Antiquities Authority for taking that interview with us on location. I hope you enjoyed the program. If you did like it, please do remember to subscribe to our channel. And also, if you'd like to receive more uh, in print form of what you saw in today's program, please do sign up for our uh, magazine. This is called Lat the Stone Speak as well. This is our latest edition about the Hittites, and it's got other uh, content related to biblical archaeology and biblical history inside each magazine. This is a magazine that comes out six times per year. And it's available to you for free wherever you are in the world. We'll send you an actual hard copy of the magazine. Uh, simply go to our website, armstronginstitute.org, and you'll find a place on the front page if you scroll down to sign up. Or you can write an email to letters at armstronginstitute.org. Simply put your name and address, and we'll follow up with you, making sure that you get a free subscription to our magazine, Let the Stones Speak.